All right, hi everyone. I'm so excited to be here in Austin. As Jeffrey said, performance, making sure that we can deliver our goods and our services to our customers in a responsible, timely manner is one of the most important topics that we're facing today. And what I found is that a lot of conversations about performance centered around implementation and you know, what can a developer do to optimize things towards the later end of a project to make sure that a site loads quickly. But what I found is there's a lot that can happen before all of that with client education and in design decisions that are going to lead to an overall faster site. So before I talk to you guys about how to design for performance, I'm going to tell you about this time that I built a site that wasn't so fast. So I was working on a responsive website for a music festival and award show for MTV. And the art direction for the site was hand done and full of textures and feeling really weathered. And there was a lot of kind of content and interaction that the site needed to support. It had ads, it had streaming video, it had social plugins. And throughout the design phase, you know, I would present work to the client and they would say, this is great, but can we add even more texture? And I'd be like, cool, yeah, I love texture. And how about a little bit of movement? I've heard about this thing called parallax. How would that look? And we're like, OK, uh, that sounds great too. And when the site launched, we thought that we'd had a pretty successful project. You know, the site looked beautiful, millions of users voted and visited and watched the video. The site was nominated for a Webby. And we didn't think that anything had gone wrong until another designer pointed out that you know, this was a responsive website, but it weighed almost six megabytes. It took two minutes and 46 seconds to load and made 136 requests. So you know, what went wrong here? Uh, I hadn't set out and, and said, I'm going to design this super slow site that's going to be a pain to code and no one's going to want to use. Uh, in the case of this project, we had three months, and we had a launch date that couldn't move. And you know, business development negotiations ran long, and then research and design ran long. So we had very little time at the end of the project to optimize for performance, which was our intention. And what I found is that these slow, heavy sites aren't an intentional thing. They are a result of poor planning at the beginning and throughout a project, poor communication you know, between designers and developers and designers and clients about the decisions that we're making, and poor awareness. So not understanding how the decisions that we're making are going to impact the performance of a site. The thing about design is that it's this balancing act. We're constantly trying to find this middle ground between business goals and user needs and delivering the best thing that we can to our clients or to our users. And sometimes creating something that's fast, functional, and lightweight can feel like it's at odds with creating something that's beautiful and memorable and on brand. But we shouldn't think about designing for performance as this battle between beauty and function. We should think about it as what's going to be the best overall user experience. Because fast sites build trust. And what brand doesn't want to appear trustworthy? And fast sites are memorable. And what brand doesn't want to be memorable? So we have to consider that performance is a design feature and not a technical concern. Because our audience wants content fast. There's been a lot of studies um, that have some pretty compelling statistics. You know, that online shoppers expected pages to load in two seconds. And at three seconds, a large amount will abandon a site. Or that people will visit a website uh, by a competitor if it's faster by more than, or faster than by uh, 250 milliseconds, which isn't that much time. And we're at this time where more and more of the world is becoming mobile. And we're dealing with various connection speeds and global network speeds that vary greatly. And at the same time, our sites keep getting larger. 
So the average size of, of websites is around two megabytes, which is you know, pretty big. Where designers come in here is because a lot of the things that make our sites slow are also the tools that designers have a lot of control over. Things like images and custom web fonts, uh, gradients that we're building into a design. So we really need to be responsible for you know, caring about the performance of our site. The thing about designing for performance is that there's this misconception that creating something fast means that we have to create something that's boring, that we're suddenly going to lose all the personality and the visual quirks of our design if we try to make something fast. But that's not true. I mean, this deconstruct site um, from this year, I mean, this is beautiful. It, it is so designed and art directed and considered, and it's super fast. There's so much personality in here. Or this Heckinger rep Report site, which you know, is striking and memorable and you know, full of personal design touches, but it also has a pretty quick load time. Or the Guardian's website, which serves up a ton of different content, but you know, it starts displaying content to a user at one second, and it's fully loaded on a mobile device at four. And you know, the design of the website still feels really close with the design of the print newspaper. So I think that we can all create sites that strike this balance between being fast and being unique. But I think that the trick is to prioritize performance from the very beginning of a project. And then setting a performance budget so we can stick to the goals that we set with performance. And then a, a key is to be deliberate, to be really designing with purpose and consider every decision that we're making. And then communicate, you know, talk to developers if they see any red flags in the design and try to fix it together. So the first step is to establish performance as a project goal. So as I was saying, if we consider performance as a set of technical tweaks that we make during implementation, um, you know, Tim Cadleck said, we can't decide that we want a fast site if we already have comps approved that have three carousels and full screen background images. So we really need to consider that performance is a goal of the project from the very beginning and include that in our statements of work, in our design briefs, and explicitly in call out that performance is going to be a goal. Um, one way uh, that I found was helpful to get everyone on board with performance as a goal is to create a user experience assessment, which was something that my company was already doing. We were evaluating you know, uh, on an existing site, how does the navigation work? Are people finding the content that they need? How's the information architecture? And we included an evaluation of the site's performance. And I think this is important because we need to consider that performance isn't this additional thing that we're tacking on to a project. It's really part of the user experience, and we need to kind of weigh all of the things that impact user experience together. Um, another way, uh, the thing that I found helpful was to share case studies of companies that have been doing good work with performance and seeing a good return on investment from it. So uh, a lot of clients are redesigning because they want to make more money or get more conversions or reach more users. So talking about how Amazon saw a 1% decrease in revenue for every 100 millisecond that they added to page load, or how Walmart saw a 2% increase in conversions for every second the page load time decreased. And Kyle Rush, a dev on the Obama campaign, blogged about how improving performance improved donations. So he said they made the platform 60% faster and this resulted in a 14% increase in donation conversions. So these are just some examples, but I think it's really powerful that if someone wants to redesign at your company or your client wants to redesign and they have certain user or business goals set, talk to them about how performance can help them achieve those goals. And performance budgets are a helpful way to actually make sure that we're sticking to the goals. So, a performance budget is a performance goal, and it's used to guide design and development. 
it's also a tangible way to talk about performance. Um, this quote from Mark Perkins at Clear Left says that you know, the important point is to look at every decision through the design and the build process as something that has consequence. Uh, a performance budget could be browser-based. So you could say, we want our pages to weigh no more than 400 kilobytes and make no more than 15 requests. Or you could say, uh, it's based on the user experience, so our pages should take no more than 10 seconds to load over a sub 3G connection. And working with a performance budget isn't that different from budgeting money. So if I have a target goal for my month, and I go over, let's say, in my food spending, then I'll need to decrease my spending in another category to stick within my budget. So similarly, if I have my overall performance budget, and I'm sticking within it, and then the client wants to add some high-resolution images to the home page, which is going to take us over budget. Then we need to think about you know, what can we optimize or remove to stick within our budget, or otherwise we won't be able to add this new feature or request. So to set your budget, um, there's a couple ways you can get started. You can look at your current pages if you're redesigning. Web page test has become kind of the tool to go to if you want to um, look and track uh, the performance of your site. And it gives you a lot of useful information about this. So you can take a look at things like page weight, which is going to cost users data money. Um, you can take a look at start render when you know, stuff starts showing up on the page. Um, speed index, which is a representation of the perceived page load um, from start to finish. So it's a little bit more closely tied to the user experience. And then you can look at competitors and how they're doing. So performance is a competitive advantage, um, as we saw from some of the case studies from Walmart and Amazon. So you can do a visual comparison in web page test, and it'll output this timeline so you can see exactly you know, what a user's experience is going to be like through your site and your competitors. You can also um, export it as video. And I think this is really powerful because you can actually see how some sites are, are loading much slower than others. And what you can do is you know, start to plot some of these numbers in a spreadsheet. So if I'm PetSmart, and I want to create a new responsive site, I can take a look at how I'm doing across some metrics and um, how some of my competitors are doing. So I can see that Chewy has the best speed index and it loads the most quickly. And then Tim Cadillac has this 20% rule, which means that people perceive tasks as slower or faster um, if the time difference is about 20%. So I can use my fastest competitor and I can set my performance budget based on 20% you know, faster than that. So there's a lot of different ways you can test a performance. You can create a performance budget, and you can test which metrics are the most important um, for your project and to your, for your client. But I think the important thing is that we're having discussions about performance budgets early. And at the project start, we're saying, what is a performance budget? and defining that and saying, you know, why is this important for our redesign so we can stick to some goals? And then say, what is our performance budget? And then throughout the project, we can evaluate. You know, every time we add a new feature or every time we design a new page, we can say, are we sticking to that budget? And we can be really mindful of what we're creating. Because the thing is that these little features and these additional styles can really add up in the end if we're not mindful about them. Um, as a designer, uh, I'll work with developers to set some budgets for myself as I'm designing. So I can give myself a 100 kilobyte web font budget and use that while I'm working. Because um, typography is one of the most important aspects of a design. And you know it, it does so much in communicating the personality of a site, as Jeffrey said, it makes our sites readable. And 
they also have a pretty big impact on the performance of our sites if we're not being responsible with the way that we're using them. So my philosophy for being smart with typography and being considering performance with typography is to do more with less. And when I'm evaluating my typefaces, I give myself a few requirements. So I'm evaluating the typefaces on emotion. You know, does this typeface convey the right mood? And then functionally, does this typeface convey the range of content needs for my content? And then performance, you know, how big is this combined type kit going to weigh? So if I'm designing, um, first I'll list out what are my emotional goals for the site and for the typography. And I can say, I'm looking for something that's bold, that's modern, that's slightly edgy and authoritative. And then I need something that has strong headlines. And, and I have a lot of statistics um, throughout the site, and that's kind of central to my content. So I need to have clear numbers at various sizes and a nice legible body copy. And then I have my performance budget that I want to stick within. So I want to stick within 100 to 200 kilobytes with my web fonts. And this gives me a really good space to do some exploration, because I've set all of these very purposeful requirements for my exploration. And then I'm free to do exploring. So you know, there, there's that discussion, does creating something fast mean it's going to lose personality? And I don't think so, as long as we are setting the right requirements at the beginning. So I'm free to do some side-by-side -side comparisons of different typefaces, and I can take a look at you know, how one headline font may have more personality, and one may feel stronger. Um, I can take a look at the way uh, statistics may look um, with the different type choices that I'm evaluating. And then once I have some type boards and type explorations resolved, I'll take a look at how the kit would add up. So if I'm going to need a headline, and that headline is going to need an italic, um, that adds up. And then I'm going to need my body copy um, or uh, a secondary typeface, and I'm going to need that in a bold and an italic. And in order to keep this kit light, let's go with Georgia for the body copy. So we're sticking within um, the 100 kilobyte budget. But then my other type board may not be doing as well. It's over budget. So I need to think about how can I condense this? Am I going to be able to achieve the, the right emotion or personality if I condense this? And if I can't, then maybe uh, it's not the right direction to go in. And then we need to be really purposeful about choosing our fallback, fallbacks with typography. Um, so last week, or not last, a couple weeks ago, um, ad blockers launched on iOS 9. And they gave us the ability to turn off web fonts um, when we're browsing uh, from our phones. And Jen Simmons tweeted this reminder which I think was just a really great reminder that you know, we need to make sure that our sites look great, even if our fonts don't load, even if someone has turned them off. Um, and we need to be really considerate of our font stacks. So I put as much care into picking my font stack as I do in, in choosing my web fonts. So this is my type scale that I set that's using web fonts. And then I can take a look at um, you know, what are some of the default iOS typefaces, and what has a similar weight or x height to my headline font and my secondary font. And what about Android? Um, what has a similar x height and, and feeling um, on the Android device? And then I can go ahead and set my font stacks and set my type scale um, accordingly just so everything looks considered, even if the fonts don't load, or if we're loading fonts asynchronously, you know, we're still going to have something beautiful. So a little bit ago, I was working with a client that was in the fast food pizza delivery industry. And the funny thing about this industry is that their whole selling point is 
speed and convenience and getting pizza to you in 30 minutes or less, and it's going to be so efficient. But their sites tend to be really slow, which is really interesting. <laughs> um, and when we started the project, we knew that performance was going to be really important for the success of the site and making sure that someone who is on their way home, that doesn't have a lot of time, that's trying to order a pizza on the street and the subway, is going to be able to do this quickly and efficiently, because that's going to deliver on your know, customer service promise. So when we talked to the client about performance, we framed it in a variety of ways. One was from a customer perspective. So they told us that their whole mission is to give their customers this quality experience. And what we talked to them about is, you know, on the web, this quality is translated in stability, performance, and reliability. And that's the way that you're going to achieve what your customers need when they need to order this pizza quickly. And then from a business perspective, they had several goals that they wanted to meet. Of course, they wanted to sell more pizzas, and they wanted to sell more pizzas online. And they also wanted to decrease the volume of call center complaints that people um, called in about the website. And the other thing that we told them is, you know, not only is pizza this uh, something that's going to help your clients and that is going to help your business, but it's also a marketable feature. I mean, what you do as this industry is you market speed and convenience. And you can market how quickly you can order a pizza on your site. Um, so when we were evaluating and talking about our performance budget, we you know, showed them the visual comparison between their site and their competitors. Um, we took them uh, and ran them through some quick you know, tests that we'd done to see how heavy their competitors' home pages were on initial load. Um, and um, I did a little bit of a fun test to see you know, how much data would be transferred and how many requests would be made if I ordered a medium two-topping pizza on um, their site and their competitors' sites. And some of them end up being pretty expensive pizzas if we consider the amount of data that uh, it's costing us. Um, and then after we had them on board about performance being a goal, we set this performance mission. And this was included within the design brief of the site. Uh, the design brief is where we talk about bringing personality on the web and um, giving users a good user experience. We also included performance as a goal. So the goal of this project is to create a beautiful, flexible, lightning-fast experience. And then we said, this is the performance budget that we're going to use for this design. And you know, we were feeling good. We felt like we had convinced the client on all the reasons why a fast site was good. Um, but we always have challenges that come up. Um, and in this case, we, had, um, we knew that they were going to get new branding at some point in the project, but we didn't know when. They were working with an ad agency, so we didn't know when we were going to get this new branding. But we knew it would happen at some point. And when we got the branding, it featured this large, beautiful pizza photography, like glamour shots of pizza, but also some very not web-friendly typography. Um, I don't know if you can tell from here, but every other letter is a different font, which of course, we couldn't replicate that style on the web. That would be ridiculous. But we needed to find some sort of way to convey the general vibe that they had with the rest of their branding on the website. So um, again, I talked to my developers about you know, what font budget should I stick to. Um, and you know, they told me, you know, this is a good amount. And I went back to my clients and said, you have 100 kilobytes to spend on web fonts, so we can stick to our performance budget. And we can either go with option A, which has three weights of Whitney for the body copy and one weight of knockout for our headings. It's a little bit more simple. Or 
we can go with option B, which is gonna be more expressive with the headings and use three weights of knockout and kind of mimic the, the style of your advertising. And we can use system fonts for the body copy. Um, in the case of this project, since they were mainly going to be using the web fonts to display like big specials and um, you know for splashy hero images on the home page. This direction made more sense because a lot of the body it's not a long form body copy site. If we were designing maybe a news site or you know something where there was a lot of reading, we might go in the, another direction and kind of wait our choose our web fonts for our body copy. Yeah, but we asked them, what's a better translation of their brand? And then we had this conversation. And I think it, this is really the key of finding the balance between you know, beauty and function and, and creating something that's unique. Um, it's figuring out when we should be using elements and figuring out why and, and what they mean to the business and when we should scale back and, and, and be more simple. <clears throat> the other issue that came up in the site was, you know, this unexpected feedback. So for the design, I had um, a static hero area that had a big, beautiful, glamorous pizza. And then the secondary area featured more of the specials and, you know, they featured seven to ten specials a day. So that was not a little baby carousel with not big images. And I was within my budget on the home page. But then they said, you know, great, but we actually need a carousel at the top. And of course, that would take us way over our budget if we were going to add that there. So what um, I think is important at this point is to remind, educate, and find a balance. So remind them that the goal of this uh, redesign is to create a beautiful, lightning-fast experience, and that the budget for this page is 600 kilobytes, and that that carousel alone is going to cost 700 kilobytes in images and JavaScript if you load in as many images as you want and make it as complicated as you want it to be. So you know, we can either not add the carousel, or we can lazy load the images, or we can load the images on click, a video on click instead of on page load. Um, but I think that when stuff like this comes up, it's important to have a conversation. So if they decide that the main goal of this site is going to be to display all of these wonderful pizza images and all of the specials, then we're going to have to scale back on something else. Yeah, but you know that's a decision that we can make together if that's the direction we want to go in. But the key is that we can't have everything, and we have to prioritize. And I think that this is why working within a performance budget is really valuable, is because it helps us have these tough conversations. You know, it's a lot easier to, to be logical and say, you know, this is our budget. How can we stick to it? Instead of saying like, no, you can't have a carousel because performance. So. Um, I think that these conversations are really, really key um, throughout redesigns. Um, and then recently I worked on um, a news site for a large newspaper in Puerto Rico. And news sites are really interesting because you would think that we should be getting emergency news to our users as quickly as possible and in a timely manner, but they also have this kind of business and sales focus that they need to serve. So they end up being really dense, and they're full of images and content and ads, um, and it can be really challenging to create uh, something that's going to load quickly and meet all of the, the goals of, from the business perspective. Uh, so for this project, the goal was to deliver the news quickly, especially to our mobile audiences. This client, because of their internal workflows, the mobile users saw a full, the, the news a full seven minutes after their desktop users because they were on separate sites and they had different workflows. So the goal of the site was to get everyone on a responsive site, 
where we wouldn't have these separate paths and we can deliver the news quickly to someone that is on their phone in an emergency situation when there's a hurricane over Puerto Rico and they can only get a cell signal, they can't get online. But a lot of the required ads um, were a big challenge and the site was gonna be image heavy because they had this multimedia content that they wanted to show off. And we were also dealing with slower bandwidth speeds in Puerto Rico. So like I said, there could be a situation where someone is um, not getting a good, not getting a Wi-Fi signal and there's a hurricane or a natural disaster and they need to see you know, what they can do. Um, and they need to be able to see this on their phone quickly. So in this case, we didn't have time to come up with a new ad strategy. They had the required ads that they needed to meet. And it was potentially possible that the initial ad load size on mobile would be you know, 160 kilobytes if they sold all the mobile units that they needed to. So again, it's a bit of an antiquated system, but in some cases for a small news team that doesn't have the resources to create custom ads, this is what they were dealing with. Um, so what I needed to do was really, really design on a budget and, and be as kind of careful as possible. So since the core page of the site was this article, I did some static mocks showing what that could look like on a mobile page and a, a larger screen. And I think this is fine to just do some exploration. Um, but what I did after that, after we talked to the clients and got buy-in on the direction, was to start to extract the reusable patterns um, in the design. And um, from what I'd done, I set a type scale that was really minimal and purposeful, and I set my color palette. Um, and while I was working, and with this mindset that I was gonna design modularly, I kind of kept in my head, don't add a style you don't need. Um, and this is really important. I think we can get a little bit carried away and add variation where we don't need to. So on the left here is my content block. And this is the content block that's gonna be used throughout the site um, on a homepage, on a section page, um, on related content in an article. And there would need to be different um, occasions where this content block would need to be a little bit different. So if a story is live or if the content is sponsored. And what I did here was I started with my content block, the main one, and then if it was live, it just got a little live flag, but nothing else changed. And if it was sponsored, it got a background image and uh, background color and an, uh, the little uh, logo. But I didn't add any more variation than I needed to. I, I think if I hadn't been designing with, uh, you know, modular thinking and, and making sure that it loaded quickly in mind, I may have made the styles wildly different. But what I found is, you know, we just need to think about like what's the minimum that we need to make sure that things feel different and have enough emphasis without adding a ton of different styles. And then the other key is to edit cons constantly. So um, something that I do um, and that I do often while I'm designing um, and this could be if I have um, things already in code or if I'm still working within comps, is I'll take screenshots of a bunch of different modules that I'm working with, and I'll put them next to each other in a document, and I'll take a look at them and say, you know, do I really need those three different headline styles? Uh, sometimes I do. Um, do I really need, you know, a, a different style for uh, bylines? No, I don't. That was a mistake. Let's get it consistent. And I think it's really valuable to just pause every now and then when you're designing and evaluate and make sure that you're actually making decisions from a purposeful manner and not because you needed to do something quickly or it made sense at the time in isolation on that one page. Um, and the other benefit um, to this is it allows us to get our designs into code earlier. So um, Scott Jell from Filament Group wrote this article 
um, that said, more weight doesn't have to mean more weight. Um, and he said that we can deliver a usable representation of a web page's content very quickly, even if that page is quite large and asset heavy as a whole. And you know, this is great to me as a designer because it means that we can still create something that feels you know, beautiful and memorable. But I think the key for this working is that we need to think about performance and think about things from the very beginning. So I think the key to this working is being able to get those designs into development as quickly as possible. Um, so in this project, you know, once I had defined some of my key styles and my key modules, um, the dev on my team got to work coding them. And we could take a look, um, and we can make changes um, if we felt that the trade-off was better um, in the end for the user and for performance. And what was great here is that we still had time in the project to go back and change things. Um, so when I showed the, the little graph in the beginning of the waterfall process where we waited to the very end to try to optimize for performance or to build something, we wouldn't have had time and our comps were already approved, so we wouldn't have had time to make these tweaks. In this instance, we could still make changes, and I could talk to my client and say, you know, you saw it this way uh, yesterday, but we decided that it was beneficial overall to make this change and for these reasons, and it's fine. You know, we still have time, and it, nothing is approved yet. So um, we took a look at the way that the navigation would work if it was adaptive versus responsive, and we were able to start testing that. Um, and something that my dev team um, found valuable was working with this plugin called Grunt Perf Budget. This is an article from one of my former coworkers about how she used it. Um, but what it does is it lets you use the web page test API to measure your site against a ton of different uh, metrics, like page weight or image sizes or rendering time. And if you have this running and you try to deploy um, to GitHub, the deployment's going to fail. So it lets us know we have an issue and that we need to fix it. And again, it's, it's holding us accountable for our performance budgets. Uh, and then the other key, um, and it seems like the most obvious one, but Communication and, and documenting the decisions we make throughout an entire project is really fundamental. So this means that as a designer, I'm talking to my developers constantly to make sure I'm not making any decisions that are going to kill site performance. And I'm also talking to my clients when they come to me asking for a new feature or they want to add something that may not make the most sense from an overall um, goal. Um, and then one of the best ways that we can communicate our decisions when we're not in the room is by creating a style guide. So, um, you know, a lot of people have been talking about the benefits of style guides, but they really showcase the best way to implement code and request assets. And they make sure that, you know, while when we're done and we, we've released something, um, we aren't creating new styles um, that don't fit within a style guide, or if we are, um, that we're really purposeful about why we're doing it. Um, this is uh, the style guide from Trulia. And um, a couple of years ago, Nicole Sullivan was talking about some of the performance benefits that they saw from having this living style guide. So the HTML was 48% smaller. They had a 21% uh, faster load time and um, a 60 percent faster time to first byte um, and they re reduced the unused CSS by 135 kilobytes just by creating this living style guide and just by being really purposeful about what they were doing and, and what they were deciding to include in a design so you know just to wrap up to make sure that you are sticking to your goals and making sites that are fast and flexible and work for your users. Make sure that you're including performance in your early project documents, in your early conversations, that you're getting everyone on board and everyone understanding why this is a good thing for the business overall and users overall. 
and then get designs into the browser as soon as possible. So I use a lot of kind of unofficial number crunching while I'm picking typefaces or while I'm designing comps, but nothing is gonna be the same uh, or it's not gonna match um, as much as actually getting it into a browser and seeing how it actually performs. Um, and again, test on real devices, even better. So you can actually see you know, how something is reacting when a user clicks on something and what response time is like. Um, then you have to collaborate. So again, I keep coming back to this, but make sure that it's everyone's responsibility and we're all working together um, to care about the performance of our sites. Um, and then educate, you know, talk to your team, talk to your clients about why this is something that we need to care about. And then document your decisions. So if we spend a lot of time working on making these really purposeful decisions, but we never document them, and we never, you know, write down why we made these decisions, someone's gonna come in after us and they're just gonna start creating new styles. So if you set a really purposeful color palette, write about why. Write about why you chose those colors. Write about why you chose the fallback fonts that you did and the type system that you did and make sure that it's known that you made these decisions from a place of purpose so that someone next that comes later or after you hand the, the work off can't scrap all of that and start adding more stuff um, to, the, to the work. And then remember, you know, this isn't this battle between beauty and function. Uh, we shouldn't be thinking about performance in that way. Instead, we need to think about creating beautiful user experiences. Thank you. <laughs>